Wow. We've, uh, my name's Jonathan Stark and I'm the Head of Pastoral Leadership, Support and Development at the Baptist Union and I'd like to introduce you to four uh, pastoral leaders uh, who have agreed to come and to sit here before you and have a conversation about uh, the way Jesus treated women and what the implications might be for our Baptist churches in Victoria. So uh, on my right here is Sarette Southwood, and she's the executive pastor at New Hope Baptist Church. Next to her is Angela Garten, and she's from uh, Hampton Park Baptist Church, the, the senior pastor there. We've got Simon Burnett here from Kyneton, the pastor, uh, senior pastor at Kyneton Baptist, and Katrina Lambert at, at Albert Park Baptist. She's the senior pastor there. So why don't we just welcome them and thank them for... <laughs> Uh, being part of this. Uh, Sarit, it would be great to start with you. Uh, many of us uh, know about New Hope Baptist. It's a very large uh, church and you're the executive pastor of that church with many people on the staff and many ministries. Could you just tell us about uh, how you came to be in the role of executive pastor and what that journey has been like for you? Thanks, Jonathan. I started um, at New Hope in 2006 and invited to be the finance manager on a part-time basis. Very quickly, that part-time role became a full-time position. Um, and back then, we had five gentlemen on the executive leadership team, and Daniel Bullock was, was one of those guys on the leadership team. And when he was called to Essendon Baptist Church, a position to open up on our leadership team. And unbeknown to me, I was told this week by our senior pastor that Daniel actually recommended to Alan that he should consider putting me on the executive leadership team. Um, and Alan actually listened to Daniel at that point, and I was appointed to the leadership team. Um, and over the years, my roles changed significantly. I um, did women's ministry as part of my role as well. Um, HR became part of my portfolio. Um, New Hope built a building that was a community center as well. So we had external hires coming in. We opened a cafe for the community called Middle Ground Cafe. Um, we had other ministries that reached out into the community. And over the years, um, started other entities around as well, a public benevolent institution that was our community care arm as well. So many things happened in our world um, and I became part of that and that became part of my portfolio. I'm um, one of the, f the only staff member that sit on all the different um, boards and committees of management and the church council as well. So I've been on the leadership team for a number of years now and it's, um, we've had people coming and going and at one point we had 50% of the leadership team were women um, and then a bit of a change again. So it's been quite amazing and I was in the wonderful position position to actually learn through that. I come from a corporate background. I'm a, I was a lawyer back in South Africa. So I've been given this opportunity to do some pastoral work from my experience. And I actually asked Alan, so putting me on that leadership role, was it what was it? Why? And, and, and yes, based on Daniel's recommendation, but it wasn't tokenism. Never at New Hope have we ever put somebody in a position just because um, I'm a woman or she's a woman or he's a man for that specific role. It becomes about what you bring to the table and the God-given gifts and talents that we have. So I've been incredibly blessed to be given lots of opportunities um, to be able to grow, to be able to stumble, to be able to make mistakes and come back and um, do all sorts of things in a very healthy team environment, Jonathan. Great, Sarit. I wonder if you could just give us a bit of insight. As you look back, was there just one moment where you can remember when you thought, gee, I'm, I'm wrapped that I'm in a church that supports so positively women in leadership? So it's not just one moment. <laughs> um, if just very recently, we had a wonderful midweek prayer and worship night at our church, and we had different segments, um, and our senior pastor led it, and at one point we wanted to pray around specific topics, and Alan mentioned the topic and asked the group there, can somebody pray? And a woman stood up, and he raised the next topic, and a woman stood up to pray, and he raised the third topic, and a man stood up to pray. And then he raised the fourth topic, and a woman stood up to pray. And I think, how amazing is that, that we are such a healthy community that women, you know, would get up. So many women would get up. Um, our new church secretary 
is a woman. We have had a church council chair who's been a woman many, many years ago. If I look at our teaching team at New Hope, there's lots of women on our teaching team. Our wider management team um, have got seven members, and four of those seven members are women. So um, we've had a, an amazing journey mm. of, of being empowered at New Hope um, and being fully held accountable like everybody else, but just a very positive journey. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Sarette. I wonder, Angela, we, we've watched the DVD tonight and see how Jesus really empowered women. W when you think about the way he treated women, what, what do you think might be some of the implications for our churches? Well, I think, first of all, I have to say, when you come to women in leadership and the question I'm normally asked, it's not usually how Jesus treated women. So it's really nice because normally people want to know how I interpret Paul's writings. You know, that's the number one thing. So it's really lovely to focus on what Jesus did. Mm. Um, and what I see with Jesus in the story of Mary and Martha is really powerful for me because, you know, Mary was allowed to sit at his feet and learn. And today, because women now have the, um, you know, access to education, we don't realise how powerful that was because people acknowledge that um, knowledge is power. You know, to educate a woman meant to give her power. And people were afraid. And I think we need to recognise that it's still about this issue of power. Should women have power? And yet, if we follow Jesus' rule, what does it mean to be in a position of power? You know, in his day and age, the hierarchy um, and the lording it over, and again and again, he instructed his disciples that power was not about lording it over, but about submission to God and service to others. Mm -hmm. And so for Jesus to treat women the way he did to empower them was not about giving them the authority over someone else, but was about giving them the opportunity to serve, mm. you know, as God called. Mm. Well, that's fantastic. You've been a leader in the church. What's the experience been like for you, Angela? I've had mixed experiences. So the church originally I was in was not a Baptist church, and my spiritual gifts were recognised, but I was encouraged to... Um, understand how I couldn't use them, okay, yes. because I was a woman. Yes. Um, and then I came into a Baptist church that was really, for me, quite mind-blowing. The pastor there recognised people for their spiritual gifting, not by their gender. Yes. So he saw what your gifting was and he tried to encourage you in that gifting regardless of your gender. Yes. And that was a really wow thing for me. And I think a really important aspect to consider if we believe that our spiritual gifts are given and not chosen, if we believe that God calls people into communities because that community needs them and then gives them the gifts to serve in that community, shouldn't we be encouraging them regardless of their gender to fulfil that calling and obedience to God? Mm. And I think for us um, moving forward... I haven't had the experience of um, Charette, but I think that's what I'd like to aim for um, in all churches, that we would mentor and train people, giving them opportunities to grow in their gifting, to learn from their failures right from the beginning, regardless of their gender. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So, Simon, you're, you're at Kyneton, and uh, you, you recently came across a, a, a kind of barrier that you discovered for empowering uh, women. Could you tell us what that was and how you went about <clears throat> facing that? Yeah, sure. Uh, for us, uh, Kyneton Baptist, the church has existed for 158 years. Um, so it's an old church, beautiful church. Uh, we've, we, the church is flourishing and growing and we're looking for another associate pastor. And for a long time, our church has been very comfortable with women um, as elders, as all sorts of things. But there's this little thing in churches that we call the tacit nerve. Any pastor, put your hand up. Um, where when we, 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 we were looking for a pastor, we, we came across this amazing person, very skilled, fits the bill. Um, but when I dropped the word that she was a woman, everything changed. And one of those tacit, uncomfortable conversations became very necessary to have. Uh, and I think the unfortunate truth is, is that these tacit nerves uh, are in, in many of our churches. Um, so we had to, with, with the deepest level of love, 
uh, with, a, with an absolute um, uh, firmness in understanding and listening, really explore this as a, as a, as a church governance team. And that was a long and extended process um, where we just had to listen, but also we had to actually work out for us, um, was this a theological issue or was it a cultural and historical issue? Um, and, and one of the comments that was regularly brought up was, well, we've, never in, we've never employed a woman in a pastoral role. Well, that's actually cultural. It's not theological. Cultural says, well, we've actually never sent a family to Cambodia either, which we just did two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So we actually have... You know, I've never, I've never employed a, 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 a pastor that rides dirt bikes for a... For a you know, so there's lots of things we've never done before, mm. but that doesn't mean that we never do them, does it? So we have to actually have to identify, is this theological or is this cultural? And then actually explore both sides to where we hold the Bible very high and realise that, that Jesus, as we've just heard a little bit more, powerfully came, as he says, to us all to, to, to set the oppressed what? Free. Mm. And we've just heard who, who is the highest level of, of or, or group category of people oppressed in first century Judaism, women and children. Mm. So why is it that, that all these years later, when we look at scripture and we see hardcore evidence of women being empowered into all sorts of roles, we hear our saviour saying, I've come to set these people free. Why is it that 2,000 years later that we're still seeing women mm. oppressed? Mm. When did the women actually get free? Mm. So we had to explore that as a church mm. really sensitively really carefully, <laughs> uh, and, and, just, and, and just let people talk. Um, and we've actually come to a beautiful place where we have 100% endorsed what was already the case, but just made that firm. Um, and that's been a, a wondrous and uh, painful and joyous process. Mm. Mm. And a little bit more grey hair. <laughs> but... Um, but good. So uh, what would you say to others that are, uh, what advice would you give for others that might be in churches that are facing a similar challenge? That love is the key. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just that because someone has a difference of opinion doesn't make them right and it doesn't make them wrong. Mm-hmm. It makes them another brother or sister in Christ mm-hmm. who, who I'm called to listen and love, mm-hmm. but I'm also called by my saviour to follow him. And so I have to hold word and culture very closely. And I need to say, okay, well, God, what is your word saying? But also what is your story saying? Mm. And your story is saying that you love me just as much as my wife, mm. male, female, and you will, you will empower her gifts as much as mine. Mm. Um, mm. And, and to love my brothers and sisters who mm. go, no, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't, we can't swallow that one. Mm. And to... To love them as they maybe leave. Mm. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Simon. Katrina, I, I, I wonder, uh, uh, you know, there's no doubt that in the people that are gathered here tonight, there'll be people that are pastors, church secretaries, there'll be delegates, people from uh, all parts of the church. And I guess they're wondering what they can do to empower women um, and what they can do to actually empower women so that we can advance the kingdom of God. What, what, what would you... So what are, what are some things that you'd suggest? Talking out of my own experience, um, one of the most significant things was that there were other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ who were willing to name the gifts that God had given me. Not, not gifts associated specifically with my gender, but just the gifts that God had given me as a human person uh, in the world, as a beloved child of God. And I think that as leaders in our churches, we sometimes underestimate the significance of naming the gifts of those people that we live and love and minister alongside of. So there's something very powerful about that. The second thing is issuing invitations. We see Jesus at the beginning of his ministry inviting the disciples to follow him, inviting them to all sorts of places and to do all sorts of things that they never imagined they could possibly do. The power of an invitation for someone who can't see that it could be them doing that particular thing, who can't recognise and name and own their own capacities and who, who feels that there are barriers to their participation. If you reach across the divide and you invite them into a place they never imagined they could be, that is a, a profound and transformative gift. And the second thing is 
Jesus had a lot to say and the Bible generally has a lot to say about our words. In Proverbs, in, in James, Jesus talks uh, and in the Gospels, Jesus talks about how our words come to represent an inner reality, how they are manifestations of our heart. And as I go around churches, as, as I look back over my life, I've heard words used in ways uh, in churches that hurt profoundly particularly women, because they reinforce the fundamental message that you are not the norm here and that you are not welcome. Uh, and it, it manifests itself in incredibly subtle ways. It's about the way that we refer to God. It's about the anecdotes and the illustrations that get told in sermons. It's about the jokes that we make uh, that happen between men and women in relationships and in families. And all of those things send a very subtle message um, to women often, uh, that you are less than, that you are not equal, that you are in a particular box, uh, and by the way, you should stay there. And, and so I think we need to be uh, very, very thoughtful about our words because as Jesus says, they come from a very deep place. They're actually our inner representations of the kingdom of God that we speak the kingdom of God into being, that we paint pictures of the future that God invites us into, and that's a very powerful thing to do. Mm -hmm. So um, naming and inviting and, uh, and speaking in ways that represent the true values of the kingdom, I think are three things that we can all do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katrina. We thought we'd finish off uh, this conversation with uh, Bill Brown sharing. He's from Sindal Baptist, and on the screens uh, he's going to respond. I asked him, you know, why he's so passionate about empowering women in his church. So let's watch his response together. As a pastor of a local Baptist church, I am really passionate about and committed to empowering women. From my earliest memories, I've had the privilege of being the beneficiary of some great examples of women and men in leadership. I've served on teams both growing up and in adulthood where having women as equals on teams has been a, a great thing where I've learned from them, gained perspective and insights. As I read scripture, I, I see Jesus and uh, Paul uh, encouraging the role of women, serving as fellow workers, being entrusted with the good news. And as I think about the situation at Sindal, as a, a local Baptist church, what is it that we can do to empower women? I did a little survey this morning among some of our pastoral team and also some of those who serve in volunteer roles within the life of our church. And we could cluster the things that they've said under five headings. And let me share them with you. The first is that we seek to develop a culture of equality. And we speak into that often and where that value is violated we seek to address it because we've all got areas of unconscious bias and we need to continually be reminded of that. A second thing is that we seek to help people serve in roles according to the way that God has gifted and shaped them rather than the gender of that person. If Jesus is the head of the church, he's the one who gives out the gifts, he's the one who shapes us, then we need to serve according to the things that he has given to us and enabled us. The third is that all people, including, certainly including women, are encouraged to have a go at things, to experiment, to try things out. And uh, even if there are areas that we need to be growing, we seek to build up rather than put down. A fourth area is for opp opportunities for women to lead and to act with authority. That might be in church council, in pastoral leadership, in uh, pastoral eldership any of those ministry uh, areas. And we encourage women to preach and teach and invest significantly in the development of women in that area. And the final area is in the area of mentoring and coaching. Certainly we encourage everybody to find a mentor or a coach, but we certainly do that for women, younger women, women in their mid years and women in their senior years. I remember a time some years back where we were addressing this whole uh, area of giftedness and particularly amongst older women there was a sense that they were actually out of sight when the gifts were given out. That's absolutely not true. All of us, all followers of Jesus have been gifted and shaped for ministry and we want to enable that in the life of our church. So I'm passionate and committed to empowering women. Alright, look, um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.